Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We have Katie Melton. Yesterday was the Octopus Movement Think Tank. What is the Octopus Movement? It is a non-linear, multi-potentialite group of human beings, uh, neurodiverse. What does that mean? It means we're all different. Thank God we are all different. And um, what we're doing today is following up on the discussion about ecocide, um, I hadn't heard that word. It's the same thing as genocide, but murdering our environment. Um, what does that do? Um, what repercussions? Uh, what are we going to do about it? It's such a huge idea. It can be a little daunting. So we start with the small versions of, of what we can do to make things happen. And those are bite-sized little things we do in our daily life. We call subtle change. Uh, today, again, Katie Melton, thank you for joining us. Good thank morning. Thank you, Darren. How are you? Good morning. I'm, I'm wonderful. I'm wonderful. Thank you so much for, for coming. And, you know, yesterday was a, a big discussion, but I don't want to get lost in that. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Um, who are you? Tell us about Pick Your Brain and um, why you joined the Octopus Movement. Yeah, so... My name is Katie Melton. Um, I say that I'm a life adventurer, um, learning by travel, but I'm a COO of a construction company by day and winemaker by night. I discovered the octopus movement actually through Pick My Brain. I had a wonderful conversation with a woman named Miyoka, and I asked her for advice. And she gave me the great advice of removing, you know, would you from a vocabulary it always should be you should do this uh yeah which was amazing transforming just tiny little thing right definitely and i i asked her i was like who would you recommend me talking to next and she goes perry so <laughs> then i had a wonderful conversation with perry and he told me all about the octopus movement and non-linear thinking and free thinking people. And I'm like, these are my people. These are my kindred spirits. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, then I went down that rabbit hole and became a member of the movement, uh, jumped right in and then attended the Ecoside uh, think tank yesterday, which is how I met you. Wonderful. And, and uh, I'm grateful to meet you. Um, definitely grateful you're here with, with me today because it would be a, a weird discussion <laughs> if I was asking nobody, you know, and, and, and you are not uh, um, nobody. You are an inspiring human that has a very complex background of diverse um, activities, thought patterns, life choices, whatever those things are. And that's a beautiful thing that has made you who you are today. And that's why when you join the think tank, you have something to say, right? If you had just gone and done a job that crushed all your creativity, where, where do you think you'd be today? You know, uh, miserable, miserable, Absolutely. Thank gosh, you know, thank gosh for people who support you in your life. So when you say, I'm not happy, they're just like, well, then find something else, right? That's the new conversation. Mental health is important. Your happiness is important. Go find something where you can be creative and you feel value. Absolutely. I, I, you know, we don't know each other that well, Katie, but I actually did not 
um, listen to that and didn't have that kind of support um, around me. It was, you know, I had sort of learned this militant disciplinary side of achieving and goal oriented lifestyle. Um, and it, it ended up crushing not only my creativity, but my physical and personal self. Um, it felt like it crushed my soul, but what it did is it actually just stirred my soul in a way. So I, I lost my vision in my left eye. I had to wear an eye patch and almost couldn't go outside for a couple of years because of, uh, couldn't, couldn't see with any kind of light going on. And so the, the result and, and you're younger than me and, and I'm, I'm glad and grateful that you see that as there's other people doing that. And there's a rise in the thought pattern of there's self going on. That's very important. That needs to be listened to. So, um, that in itself is inspiring. Um, you know, and, maybe a, a whole other interview. I'd love to know how you got there at, because it's very important. Everyone gets there a different way. You know, um, I, I had to basically crush myself to get there, you know, um, and I, I don't want other humans to, to think that way or do that way. And, and that was what linear um, and in the box thinking put me in, um, you know, and since then, since the movement, um, I find inspiration, um, you know, talking to people like you about hot air balloons, right? Like, and, and tell us, tell, tell us the quick story about the hot air balloon. That's so cool. We, yeah. we both have hot air balloons in our life, which is very odd. <laughs> I was part of a hot air balloon crew. And one of the many things that we would have to do is go knock on people's door so we could land in their backyard if we drifted <laughs> off the path. And so I, I'll go and knock on someone's door and just be like, hey, can we land in your backyard? We have champagne, bottle of whiskey as a thank you. You can ride this balloon and people would be in their pajamas or drinking coffee at like seven o'clock in the morning, just being like, what did you say? What's happening? What's going on? Hot air balloon in the back. Come join. Let's go. You're late for the party. Um, and usually it was, it ended up being a fanfare and most often than not, people allowed us to land in their backyard if we told them that we would send them up in the hot air balloon for a ride or give That's them, you know, a mimosa. <laughs> <laughs> That's so wild. And, and I had a hot air balloon land in my backyard when I was a kid. I was by myself, had no idea what was going on, but I thought it was really, really cool. <laughs> and so, <laughs> there was no adults in my life around when this happened. So it was, uh, <laughs> it was um, you know, maybe it was my imagination. I don't know. But no, it was beautiful meeting those people. So I, w I wanted to sort of start with a light story because we're talking about ecocide and what that is 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 the same thing as genocide um on our planet on our earth on our plants and animals on other human beings because we're all actually part of the ecosystem as well um what is that to you and um and where did you learn that term because it is a new term for me so I learned the first time that ecocide got brought up was actually an environmental studies class that I did. And then this whole climate change discussion that has taken us over globally, um, I heard it pop up every once in a while. And I just didn't really take it into heart. I'm like, okay, it's another side, right? Genocide, et cetera. Um, what does that really mean? And in the grand scheme of things, on um, some sort of level, we're all responsible for it. We're all killing the environment in some way or another because we're using its resources. We all live in houses, we're plugged into electricity, we're using our cars. Yeah. So it really hit home um, that this needed to be more of a discussion of what we can do as be, instead of being ecocide to being part of the ecosystem and like more of a companion or champion of the environment a couple years ago. So to me, it means, you know, this is a, this is a global problem. There's definitely things that we can do even on a micro level, like some of the biggest problems can be solved by very simple solutions. 
That is so true. Actually, all problems are, you know, really um, scientifically and in construction, right? Major, major issues need to be broken down in the smallest chunk that we can handle right now. What can we do in the present? Like I'm a project manager. I've, you know, managed facilities and buildings on the multi-million dollar level. And, and it doesn't matter the price tag. It always comes down to you can only do what you have today. And I'm not working a 40-hour day in, in a 24-hour day. So what can I do today? And sometimes it's, hey, guys, let's just clean up. Because right now we don't know what to do, but we can do something. And so you clean up the space around the job site. So when you get back, you can have a freer thought space, right? You can, okay, what can we do? Now we have space here. And, and to me, that's also the same thing is when we start taking these bite-sized chunks, we also are finding space for, you know, the path we're going and, and listening to more ideas in that way. If we don't take those bite-sized chunks, like, join you know you don't have to join the the octopus movement but if i didn't know what ecocide was and i was listening to it you know i would then be engaging in a new conversation that could be a bite-sized chunk for a person that's never done anything right um and so the bite-sized chunks um you know the title of today's show subtle change um a lot of times has to do with um, a heart change and a mindset because that's what sticks you know, you can discipline yourself into saying like, you know, um, I'm going to be vegan for a week or something like that. I see people do that and, and I see the struggle with it and it looks like they're quitting heroin or something, you know, they're just, it's like, it's very serious and it's hard for that person, you know, well, maybe they need to do a different change that isn't as painful that allows the heart change to happen over time. People were patient with me. I didn't change overnight. I didn't shed my rigid perfectionist and perfectionism. And I haven't shed that completely. The military ideas of control and, you know, um, work first. Like it was just get the job done. Like those are things I had to let go first. And then when I let go of those ideas, I found that I just had a, a more open spirit and then I had space for people like you that when you spoke about ecocide and you spoke about what is happening in your area or when I meet Perry and I find out what is going on across the sea, right? Like this is happening everywhere. All of these discussions and people again were patient with me and I had to do a, had, had a long heart change process, you know? Um, and so what I wanted to know is, is how did you become more conscious of the earth in general, plants, animals, whatever, however you see the earth? Um, and how did you expand your worldview or, or how are you doing that today? So, so in 2019, um, before then I lived in a very nice suburban bubble. Um, I hate to say it, but you know, my life revolved about round about work and what I had to do. And we had cars and kit, you know, house businesses, all that stuff. So it was very cluttered. Um, and the environment as much as I was conscious about it was every year I had plant flowers and I lived in a logging community. So we would replant trees and I'd have a garden. Um, how I became more conscious of the earth or what we're, doing to it, or at least in my personal, is I took a proper gap year, and not everyone's going to be oh, able wow. to do this, but I bike toured, so I jumped on my bike and <laughs> basically became homeless for six months wow. as I was bike packing across the United States, and then we went to Europe and traveled, and we had this whole experience. Well, when you're on a bike, <laughs> there's little room. You have to actually manage what you have with you or waste. Like, I don't want to take garbage across the mountaintop, but I also don't right. want to throw it. And then you see these beautiful, pristine places, and there's a plastic bottle on the side of the road. Like, at the end of the day, I was starting to collect 
I was just on my bike on the side of the road and I would just start picking it up because I was going to throw it away at the next gas station. Um, right. And I was there and then there's cars flying past and everything else. So it gave me a unique experience of, ex of actually experiencing, uh, the lack of consideration people have, like, it's just one bottle. They threw it out. But at the end of the day, I would have a whole bag full of garbage. So that's, that's kind of um, the garbage thing is, is, is just a reminder. Uh, it's, it's the, in your face of just the small thing too, right? It's mm -hmm. if you're seeing it there, at the smallest level, where else is it? Um, I'm in the desert um, of Washington State, right? A couple hours outside of Seattle. And when you go to Seattle, um, for the most part, although now they're very, they're struggling deeply with homelessness, um, but it's a pretty tidy city. It's no Singapore, right? But it's cleaner than New York. It smells better than San Francisco. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's tidy. Um, and as soon as you come out here and you start driving the back roads of the desert, you see garbage just everywhere floating mm -hmm. around. It's just, it's just everywhere. Um, and I have never biked across the U S or across Europe. Um, I visited Europe as a kid that did help a little bit my worldview, but I would tell you the same thing what you're saying is like I had to not even go biking at a speed. I had to not move. That's how slow I needed to go to pay attention. And so um, I'm recovering from a surgery and, a, and an injury from a year ago. And so I moved out here to have a surgery and heal. And what happened was a mindset change. I started looking around and my, my biking across the U.S. came from meeting people like you in slow motion here because I, I can't go driving to the store there's nothing to do here there's nothing to go i go outside and watch and listen to the birds i walk down by the river and then what's at the river trash right mm -hmm. and so i'm starting to go wow it's really everywhere and um you know what's <laughs> what's really remarkable is um you know you're picking up garbage and, and you're finding a message inside yourself. When I go to the beach and pick up garbage, um, I almost always find an eagle feather. Um, I don't know if that's uh, a mistake um, for anybody concerned. Yoda nugu on Konkianis, Yoda Likwichtawi. I am from the Likwichtawi people, and, um, and this is for ceremonial and religious purposes. Um, so I collect these and give them to other tribes and other people um, that I come into contact with. But when I find them, almost every time there, it's, I see a plastic bag in the sand, I'm pulling it out of the sand, and underneath is a feather that looks destroyed. And when I wash it, it looks like this, when I clean it. And so my slow motion journey was very similar, just not biking across the US, you know, and so um, what a great concept um, and challenge to, to any person is if you if you have the time and space, maybe just slow down. Um, if you can jump on a bike, do it. But if you can't just take a walk, right, if you add if you add that into your into your day and you've never done it before like that could be the subtle change maybe you're you're not doing some environmental work but you're starting to see that the environment does care about you and if you care about it it will support you and we can support it we don't have to remove and take and and you know rape and pillage the this beautiful ball we're floating around the universe on right yeah exactly <laughs> we don't we really don't. You can. There was a pause uh, with this lockdown and everything else. One, I'll be truthful. I got really lazy or really annoyed that I had to take out the garbage so often. And I'm really actually focusing on waste management because I feel like this is the most subtle way that you can actually bring change just into your personal life. 
I just didn't want to take out the garbage. Like that, mm. that was just my motivation. It was so selfish. So I started composting to get rid of all the food products. Um, and then half my garbage was gone, just the food waste, right? So, but now I have compost and I can actually give back to the earth and just put it back into the, basically put it back into the soil so everything else can, you know, use it. And then I, I stopped using shampoo. I don't know, this is just this underground movement of no poo, so no shampoo. Um, and How do you deal with your hair? getting yeah. um not like uh so i have long hair as well uh, that it's new new to me because i i spent my life with short hair until recently um i learned of the boarding school movement across the united states and what that did to my family and i'm like oh, i'm gonna let let my hair fly for whatever it needs to but i i would like to let go of shampoo and don't don't know how to do that without making my my hair is very curly and wavy you know i look like farrah fawcett in the morning <laughs> so, Love it. what what do you what do you I use <laughs> right um, I, use, I use baking soda um but i'm to the point now where my scalp is healed my oil is like in natural production because you don't actually need to wash your hair every day mm -hmm. strips your scalp and hair of its natural oil that it's already creating um so once you get past the point of it gets really gross um about every two weeks i just use baking soda and vinegar wash out the little excess oil and slap my scalp and then it's ready to rock and roll and my hair is also very curly but i did actually wash it yesterday with baking soda so it's still a little wet <laughs> So baking soda and water, you make like a paste? I just make it like I put so much water in it that I could just use it through a spray bottle. So you don't need okay. a lot of it. It's just to grab the excess oil. And so you, it's not you're not using it like a shampoo. You use it like a dry shampoo almost. Yeah. Uh, in the shower, I use a spray bottle. I spray it at my roots, rinse it back out. Wow. All the and oil, just brush your hair and. You know, it's funny. Um, it seems silly to just talk about us washing our hair um, right. and other people won't get that. But, you know, we, we could talk 20 minutes about uh, uh, th how and why, because I haven't done that yet. And maybe I should. My daughter also has said to me, you know, you know, you, you don't have to wash your hair every day, you know. And um, so I started cutting back on that. And then I realized even the products I was using had lots of chemicals in it. And as I backed up and backed off of chemicals in general, um, you know, I'm realizing they're everywhere. And like, I, yeah. and, and I can choose, you know, what I want to, to utilize. Um, I'm in the middle of, of a fruit pocket here in the desert where on the right hand side is a huge orchard of pears. In the middle, there are uh, vineyards, and then on the other side, apples. And I thought that was amazing when I first moved here. I'm watching all this fruit come in. And then um, I hear of two men last year that died from pesticide exposure in the fields, right? And I was like, wow, that's crazy. Um, and at that time, I started not being able to eat apples or bananas. My tongue would get swollen and all of this stuff. I'm like, how in the world have I spent my entire life eating these things and now I can't eat them? Um, all this to be said, I'm going somewhere with this. The the Now I'm here and I've been here slower because I've been here you know, since October and it's a slow pace and I'm watching the leaves come and I'm, I'm seeing these fields come back to life. I watched them die in the winter. And now I see these young men for the sake of money driving around on a four-wheeler pulling this diesel gas it's a diesel powered fan and it blows pesticides about 20 or 30 feet in a circle in the air above this guy and he has a plastic suit on and a mask um, but i know with 100 certainty he's being he's going home with those on him 
you know there is no way unless you have a military mop suit which is the thing that you know you see in hazmat that covers everything mm -hmm. it's getting into you and you're taking it home to your children and like that really bothered me it, just to see that there's humans doing this and they're getting paid nothing to do that i mean and i see the farmer's house is literally up on a hill here with a huge sign a billboard sized sign that he had made for his wife that says hope um, which is beautiful for them, but it's not beautiful for the small man that comes here from Peru or Mexico or Argentina that now may go home with some kind of damage to their body and no rights to come back and protest in five years. I have brain damage. Um, I don't share that all the time, but I've hit my head, you know, a couple dozen times and, um, and it has affected a lot of things in life um, and I've gotten more conscious as I've gotten to not allowing things into my system that can affect that I know heavy metals are the worst thing in, on earth so I'm very careful with aluminum and aluminum pans I won't drink out of a can you know and a lot of people think that's weird whatever that's my personal protection and and I I don't really get um, I don't talk about it a lot either, you know, but it's been a slow progression and watching those things, watching the chemicals being blown on fruit has had me now going, I certainly am eating organic because that's chaos, right? In the sixties, they were using agent orange for, to, to protect vegetation from plants. And now we have class action lawsuits and military veterans that are brain damaged and central nervous system wrecked from the same product we were eating. So if we ate it, is it still in our system? We don't know. Those things are, are not tested over a hundred years. They never have been. And so, um, you know, for, for getting the shampoo is an important idea because it's something I want to, uh, now I'm very interested. And so, um, you know, I, I'm going to probably talk to you offline, you know, about exactly like, tell me, give me the recipe cause I'll forget it. And let's maybe post it in the chat and say, Hey, we talked about washing hair today and what that means. Um, you know, so first of all, baking soda is less expensive. Second, it's not toxic, right. Um, to the environment or to yourself. And when you add a bunch of water to baking soda, it becomes what we call inert. And that's a, a chemical process that basically is like it's, it's as safe as water. It's not going to hurt anything. And the products in, in shampoo, the dye, fina, bada, bada, a lot of those things may never become inert. Without, it doesn't matter how much water you add um, you know, to, to some chemicals and products, including pesticides. You know, washing them off doesn't remove them always. Um, I never know how to turn those beeps off on my computer. Um, but the, you know, the mindset of uh, I'm going to learn a different way. And really, the way we're doing it now is a new way. It's, it's recent, probably since, what, 1920, right? That you need to wash your hair every day, 1930 maybe. Um, you know, probably around the era of when um, deodorant came out uh, as a product. And that was, um, I think, mostly focused, if I remember, towards women that, hey, you, you're going to be disgusting if you don't smell like a flower all the time, right? And then you need to shower all the time or bathe all the time. That's where that stuff came. And if we understand it, that's all just marketing BS. It was corporations that made that up. It was an idea to get us on board. And here we are, 100 years later, now it's culture. Right. <laughs> and it's, and to put it into like a logical thinking, like once you get past the vanity of it, it's easier because now you don't have a daily upkeep of having to wash your hair every night. Take that off your list. I'm good with that. But it also, just me personally, I'm saving 30 bottles out of the landfill 
I'm also probably cutting wow. my shower in half. So, you know, instead of 15, 20 minutes spending eight to 10, well, that's two gallons per minute. So saving water on top of it. Plus I'm not putting all of that down into just like all the soap been chemical you're talking about chemicals but none of yeah. that's actually going back into the sewer system either so then on the other end even though i'm a small portion of it it doesn't take very much for the sewer you know the water treatment plant to actually clean up the gray water that's coming from my house absolutely so it's it just compounds also it can circle back like my garbage is now minimal and I don't have to take the garbage out every, you know, every other day or every two days, how much mm. waste we use. So it's like, that's a very small thing that you can suddenly move towards that makes it easy for you. It's cheaper. So it saves money and it has all these compounding other things that can be a subtle change to help everyone. Yeah. And the composting, it sounds like you've made that a joy and a hobby to where a lot of people would think, I I have to do this thing. And it's a rigidity. Um, and, and you've turned that on its head and and you actually like, oh, I I kind of dig it. I like the what's what's happening here in the process. Tell us about how you fell in love with that. Yeah. So people have to get over a mindset and I did too, is that composting or throwing away food, uh, it's supposed to rot. It's supposed to smell. It's supposed to be slimy and gross. So you just need to find a spot where you're okay with that. And they make composting bins that you don't smell it, nothing, just throw it all away. And then when you turn it, you have fresh soil and I love plants. My house is so full of them. My like yard is now full of plants. Um, and it just, now I have flowers to look at, right? Like I don't have to go down and buy fertilizer because I'm creating my own through the food that I'm not eating, like all the peels and all the things. Next, I want to yeah. do it to paper towels because that's something that you can't recycle. Worms love them. So That's you know, a great idea. It's not too hard to have a worm box. Some people are grossed out about it. You know, find a neighbor kid that likes to play with worms. I don't know. It's just <laughs> fishermen want them to yeah. all the time to go out and fish and I, they're good for the garden too. So it's just yeah. compounding. First, it's just buying a little bucket, put all the peels in instead of going down the garbage disposal or in the trash, take the little bag compost or thing let it all mold and mulch and you can put all sorts of things in there. Yeah. I, I can't wait to try that. Um, so we were in, you know, sort of a townhouse scenario before, uh, in Seattle. Um, and we started growing, uh, our own food there. My wife did a little bit on the porch, whatever we could do, um, last two years. And then we moved out here and it's so dry that even the farms here, you know, they can't compost. There's not enough moisture in the soil or it just doesn't rain. Um, and so that's been odd, you know, to have a garden that can't really compost. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I never understood, I never knew that that was a possibility. So not everybody can compost, but what's funny is what you were saying about the paper towels. That's what I've already switched to because I was, I noticed how much I used and, you know, as, as a, a former cook, you just clean really quickly, you know, and you just, you don't pay attention to that. Like, so I get in like this mindset, almost like I'm back in the professional kitchen again and I'm just moto mode, just, you know, and, and what I somehow was able to see is like, Oh man, all of a sudden there's way too many paper towels. I used a half a roll cause I fried chicken or something, right? Um, fried some fish or did something. I made a huge mess, which I always do. And so I switched and I, I just got a bunch of, um, rags, you know, um, and we switched our cleaning products even to where some of it we make, some of it is sort of a mix of, you know, like a natural product. Um, 
again, I'm avoiding chemicals because of my brain stuff. But the paper towel thing, you know, it's become something where we were taught that when there's a mess and you touch it, it's really disgusting and it needs to go in the garbage. Yep. Like food ha is gross. And like, if I have to clean up my dog's urine, that has to go in the trash can. We, we've forgotten that for thousands, tens of thousands of years, we cleaned things, you know, off of ourselves. And that is safe and, and we can be healthy about that and not disgusting. Um, and so I just had to learn how, how do I do that? And so I just bought a f couple cases of regs and, you know, it's, it, and then, uh, you know, our neighbor crochets these dish cloths and they gave us some of those. And I, I, I feel like a hippie a little bit. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, what is a hippie? That's really indigenous lifestyle, you know, minus the uh, running around naked with drugs because I'm not doing that these days, <laughs> you know. But the composting, again, it can be a hobby. There's a lot to it depending on where you live. There's all kinds of things you can do with it, like the worm box or other ideas. Um, my wife is, since we moved here, definitely growing more food. Um, and our hope is to someday have enough space to where we can, you know, have a majority of our food come to our doorstep by our own hands. Um, you know, even, you know, you said something that hadn't dawned on me about the soap, even, um, cutting soap out saved you 30 bottles a year but then how much fuel that's a case that's one or two cases probably of shampoo that either didn't need to go on an airplane uh you know some truck or anything and if you know if a hundred people like you did this that's a hundred cases well oh holy crap that's half a truck and then if what if it's a whole truck and then what if it's a container what if it's a ship what if it's a container ship that we no longer need of these products that would be crazy and that's what i'm looking forward to because like you said people are coming to this their own way um you know and part of the octopus movement what i love about how perry's approach is you know is in the think tank is there's no wrong answer there's no wrong person and to allow all ideas and so part of that is i need to learn from others keep my mouth shut and and investigate and try try ha sample yeah. with life and and make mistakes and there's no perfect way to eliminate your waste or do any of these things but i love the idea of making it fun, you know, growing food. Um, I never paid attention to it. And my wife started seeds in the house and I brought, I bring my studio lights in the house at night and you could watch from the morning time to when I got up and it would be an inch on these beans. And I'm just like, wow, it was, it was, it was driving my mind insane to watch things come up and you know i never knew well i didn't know what broccoli looked like i didn't know how cauliflower looked like on the ground um, and now we have neighbors around us that are growing organically that are also saying hey we grow too much so when it's harvest time half of this is yours and, we're, and so th what if all of us were doing a little of that and sharing how much waste would be eliminated in the packaging in yeah. all of this stuff like that that's where i was going with this my long-winded story was the packaging around the vegetable vegetables that we're buying now we don't need that it's ridiculous and <laughs> it changes if you do it yourself well and kind of along the same lines i had a friend in high school who had never tasted an actual like garden grown tomatoes always from the store. And she's like, Oh, I hate tomatoes. I'm like, hot house tomatoes are not the same as this tomato that you grow from your garden. 
and she's just she tried it she's like oh that's what food's supposed to taste like right like finding the joy it's more approachable finding the joy of actually growing something yourself uh cooking it eating it being able to dispose of the things properly so you're giving back or not making such a large footprint it's it's completely different it's just it doesn't have to be these big global changes either so right yeah what if we don't have to have a shipping container to ship all these packages because now our food's grown locally okay well we might not get a tomato all year but what if we can it's, yeah it's in our backyard um yeah and we you, we can yes, change our eating habits too by by just, what you make yeah in yesterday during the conversation you had said we need to make it approachable we need to have a, a positive conversation well simple things like that can be a positive community change and it can be part of a community community garden school whatever shout out to detroit with all their community gardens like they took lemons to make lemonade <laughs> right um so it's just things that you can actually do on a bigger scale that can involve a lot more people yeah i like that i was trying to get that in the comment um <laughs> well another thing while you're typing away uh that came out of it was and kind of circling back to the whole marketing thing how do we make it sexy like how mm -hmm. do you package that and make it so people want to try it it's not an inconvenience it's just another way to do it people don't actually have to go super out of their way to make these large changes it's not going vegan and giving up cheese which is kind of like heroin i don't know oh yeah um love cheese <laughs> right <laughs> that's the biggest part um <laughs> But like just smaller changes that actually ease the pain of our everyday society in a way that we right. can market it as this new lifestyle that people actually want to be a part of. You know, you don't have to wash your hair every day. Heck yeah, that frees up so much of my time. <laughs> <laughs> right. You don't have to go to bed with wet hair. That's the worst. Yeah. Too. Like I hate that. Um, awful. <laughs> you know, the those are great small like that's a whole chain of bite-sized ideas that everyone can do you know the mm -hmm. hair even the biking you know the biking the community garden um taking care of your own compost cutting back on paper towels and paper products waste all of those things and having fun and even if you don't want to give up those things right now if you're disposing them in a new way that's actually beneficial or again giving back then it could also be greatly beneficial um you know another thing is like incentivizing how how do we make it so the people who are already out doing these things so if there's a a fisherman who's actually taking their boat out they have the gas already or diesel that they're using which We'd hate it. But, you know, instead of sending somebody else out right after them and using the most diesel to pick up garbage out of an ocean, how do we incentivize it so the people that are already doing it also start removing it? Like, instead of just right. leaving it there, how do we make it so they're more willing to, like, just pick that up because now it's going and doing something else that's beneficial for them or positive? I mean, you're speaking my language there because my my whole tribe in Canada, um, they almost, uh, I guess I, I wouldn't say all, but there's a large population of fishermen that are large vessel commercial fishermen take using a lot of diesel to go on a trip, um, you know, um, getting salmon up in the Bering Straits, you know, way out. And so if there, you know, if there was a process, you know, what happens with a lot of times on these fishing trips is they're going out and they just sit. They're driving out sitting. I don't know if you've ever even seen it, but there's just out in the middle of the ocean, there'll be a whole line of boats as if there's an imaginary starting line for a race, you know, um, 
and a lot of times they they just leave, they're leaving the engines running right because it's the generator for everything inside the boat it's like a a hotel for six or ten or some of them 20 men and women um you know and they're just sitting there sitting there and then then the food season opens where they have 12 hours to go fish and then they capture their fish and sometimes they sit there again so the fish are on the boat and then there's another vessel come out a processing vessel that will take the salmon or mostly salmon uh, whatever else they are dragging for onto this big boat so that they don't have to drive all the way back. So that wasn't to save fuel. That was all about money, correct? Like mm-hmm. we all can agree on that. It's not yeah. where people are thinking in in the fishing game a lot of times. You know, but what if, what if there was an incentive for them? What if there was a way to open a season and maybe give living wage to people to ride these vessels because you know half the year they're sitting right i don't know if you know that they can't they yep. do not get to fish around the clock or any of that the the seasons are hours long sometimes sometimes one hour four hours of a fishing season for commercial fishermen and so you know they could potentially drag for garbage. I don't know if that would ruin their nets or if there has to be a new process, but that's what the octopus movement and the think tank is about. And so you've inspired an idea to me that I can then go start talking to tribal members and other family members to say, maybe there's an industry that we haven't developed yet. And this new industry is actually gonna bring us back to what we want. And that's a a whole environment that's taking care of itself and eliminates the need for fish farms. Fish farms are also um, hugely um, adding to uh, hazardous waste in our environment. People don't understand that. So, um, well, there's another small change, right? You could decide, I will no longer buy, if it says farm raised fish, I won't buy that anymore. I've chosen that because I'm I'm watching the tribal newsletter and I'm watching the comments and people in the outrage about what these fish farms are doing to our community. You know, on paper, they're offering jobs and careers and it's uh, smoke and mirrors because there's they aren't paying those people enough to move on in their life or do anything. It's just enough to be stuck and make more mess that they're doing. It's like the farmer paying the man on or woman on the tractor here to gas vegetation and themselves. It's the same thing, you know? And so what a great idea, by the way, that could be, I don't know if you understand how big of an idea that is. That could be a hugely global idea. It's an enormous problem. How do we incentivize it? How do we get people to actually start yeah. picking up and disposing of these things? Like, I don't want to, you know, another big problem is once they pick up this, incentivize it, where does it go? Like landfills, just bigger problems that probably have a simpler solution. So yeah, leaving it out there for people to actually like, do another think tank or come up with their own ideas. And I bet there's some that are out there from somebody that probably nobody thought of it would come from. That's how the best ideas come, you know, out of inspiration, out of frustration, out of passion, out of anger, you know, I got to fix this thing. Um, and so I love that, that concept of, um, just a new idea. I mean, you're not even a, you're not a commercial fisher, fisher person, fisherman. And here we are talking about something that, man, I have ties. We could make change. Even if I just talked to one boat captain and they said, you know what? I'll pick up trash on the way home. And they did it once. That's something. It's you doing your compost. And then maybe someone else says, hey, why'd you do that there, Jimmy? And he's like, oh, well, Katie mentioned that this was a big problem and I want to do my part. And then the other guy goes, oh, okay, I'll do something. And then it catches on. It's why I'm not eating meat right now. 
Well, it's even goes more than that, right? Like if you start rebuilding a habitat, there's more fish, it's easier for them to catch it, right? That's the incentive. Like if yeah. you don't have garbage in the habitat of, you know, what you're farming, whether it's cod, salmon, tuna, halibut, what, whatever it is, if those populations come back and it's, you know, like you're walking across the back of the salmon across the river, which that's the imagery that we always see. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's just, okay, well, if their habitat is healing because there's not garbage, then there's more food, then there's more, you know, fish that can actually be spawned or there. And then it's easier for us to actually have those things, right? So yeah, if a fisherman doesn't have to go 200 miles to go find fish and they're 30 miles, how much fuel is he served? Like saving? How much is yeah. that stress off of those guys? How much stress is it off the boat dock? You know, all this stuff. So yeah, it's compounding. Well, you know, one thing that I didn't even realize my son is in the detailed business and they, and he cleans yachts, you know, and, just the chemicals that they're using to clean boats because their boats will get ruined and they do it in the water because it's too expensive to pull them out. And these chemicals are hitting the water. And, you know, fortunately enough, my son was in the doing language class with, with us, you know, that during that year and he started to go, Whoa, I, I don't, I don't really know if this is good for for the environment or what i'm doing <clears throat> you know and just just the challenge of to ourselves is what i'm doing good for the next person behind me um the person next to me um you know is this going to be good for me later if you're just selfish right is it going to be good for you later no it's not going to be if we just don't do anything because if you stand back and watch the news which I choose not to participate in. But if you stand back and watch, it's it's a lot of bad news and getting worse. Um, you know, sure, things in pockets, you know, get better. Um, but it isn't changing fast enough until we all make our small changes. Thanks for stopping by, Michael. Um, what is he saying? Companies and agriculture operators often will need a bigger incentive to, go to do good which is true unless we make it cool. Government assistance or tax benefits, for example, true, sad but true. Um, I'm, I'm sort of an old punk rocker, public enemy fan, and I'm not a big government fan. Uh, I'm also seeing in history as I research what government has done with its tax benefits and money. So I, I have a bigger belief uh, that there is a greater good happening and that there's going to be human beings funding this, not our government. Because I, I think um, if you truly understand um, where and how the U.S. government started and where we are today, it's very much similar to how we started. It's just a little bit, um, got it has icing on it now, so it looks pretty. But there's a lot of things happening that, that, um, that don't line up with the greater good, um, and we think it's, uh, you know, for the sake of moving forward a lot of times where we just allow things to move on and or don't say anything. Um, so I guess that's my soapbox for government money um, because I think there's bigger and better money out there. You know, if, if one guy can make enough money to shoot a bunch of rockets into the sky and do whatever he wants, then there's enough money out there if we make this popular. And we make this popular by taking these small changes, I think, um, having these conversations. And Michael, again, thank you for your comment. Um, when we have these conversations, uh, I tend to get contacted by people that are of that higher echelon, CEO level, global leaders that do want to make change. And they don't know how because it's uncomfortable for them as leaders to make the change. It's not popular because what they are doing as a corporation is they have to, you know, spend more money a lot of times to make the right choice. 
And that's the weird thing, right? It costs more money to eat organic these days. There's no incentive for us to eat organic um, outside. There's no government incentive, yet it's better for us, um, you know. So what are your thoughts, Katie? Well, for one, I don't, these smaller changes aren't supposed to be, to me, coming from companies or agricultural operators to get bigger incentives. It's it's communities, it's a small thing. So if a small organic farm, you know, they need seeds, they need ways to compost, they need everything else. Well, what if they ask the community and they're incentivized so they don't actually have to purchase a whole bunch more, excuse me. Um, like what can the community or small operations do as individuals? Not so much huge conglomerates or companies, but like, what can you do at a smaller level to make a bigger difference? So sure. the incentive for a smaller community, if they like organic farmer, if people in the community are actually giving away their compost because they don't have abilities to compost or like all their food waste or whatever they can do, if they can facilitate that, well, then that's another, another product that they have, right? Like an organic farm can sell organic compost to other people or provide it to other community gardens and they're just taking it on. And then, you know, it's another, they have stuff to grow their own farms, but also give, sell something back, which super easy, but how do you facilitate? Like, is it a drop off? Do you go pick it up, et cetera? Well, those are just logistical issues and those are easily solved. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's uh, coming right. from an operations <laughs> officer, like logistics <laughs> is my life. So it's like, to me in my brain, I'm like, yeah, that's no problem. We'll, we'll coordinate that. <laughs> I, I would love to be participating in that right now. When we want to grow something, I'm buying it in a bag, which is terrible. I'm buying dirt in a bag. What? Yeah. I'm buying compost in a bag. That seems nuts. And if I had a resource to connect, I'm sure there's an organic farm around here. I just don't know where they are because there's nothing but land everywhere. I wouldn't know. They don't put signs right. in the middle of nowhere to go, you know, 20 miles down a road you've never been, you know. Yeah. Um, Michael had one more comment. Growing up in New England, knowing some commercial fishers, they would never pick up trash unless they had a financial reward. Yeah, Michael, you know, growing up around fishermen myself, um, it's a hardened lifestyle. It's... Um, you know, it's an industry that that draws people that don't know how to make uh, financial means in a better way sometimes. And so they go out and it's uh, their bodies are abused. Uh, they're working these crazy seasons and then they come home and they're using drugs or alcohol to cope with the physical and mental pain of just having to go back to do this. Um, it's a pattern and, and, you know, that's another thing. Like, why are we making human beings do that? Um, you know, those guys aren't going to pick up trash because they don't feel good about themselves. They're out there just to make money. They're not out there because they love fishing. If you know, the commercial fishermen, a lot of times, I mean, there are some that love the aspect of the danger and that kind of stuff. Um, but there still could be a financial reward. Um, let's just say by chance I owned a fuel company and I started having a heart conscience about what I was doing to the environment. And maybe I, I decide, oh, I can't just kill my business because it's what I've always done. And that person doesn't know what they can do. They can't stop fuel, but maybe they can take a million dollars and say, listen, I'll buy, you know, 24 dumpsters of garbage from the next four fishermen that get back here. And each, if you fill it, it's worth this amount of money and like, and put that on the, the news and make that a popular thing. And maybe, you know, maybe something like that could be, um, you know, fun or make a change. I mean, look, they put deadliest catch on television and that became a huge thing that people loved watching. Um, what if we had deadliest pickup that was a follow-up and when they weren't running around with crab pots, you know, they, they clean up the ocean and, and we can hear them, you know, cussing or doing their thing. And 
they don't like it, but they're making money, and then they're getting popular because they're on television. Not only that, we've we've made something random and fun that people that watch television love, you know. And so, yeah, there's there's small things that we could we could do. Hey, Perry. Um, but we, if we make them enjoyable, and when I say fun, I don't mean kitschy fun. Like if we truly could find joy in a lot of these things, picking up garbage as a community, sharing our food as a community, harvesting fish as a community, whatever that is in, in a sharing way, you know, then what, what, joy would come from that may actually change the physical problems we're having in this world also that's my that's my bigger global idea is that if we slow down um and care for ourselves first and one another that the stress diseases that we see amongst the world will hopefully go away um it certainly healed me as a human being you know i um and so i've seen and met other people that are also finding their way by making small changes um you know in their environment that that make them feel better less stressful you know i love how you started out you know your journey on on a bike um because i'm sort of you know i'm not ending my journey i'm i'm 43 uh you know but i'm just now riding a bike again after so many years of dealing with you know, a lot of just physical things, disability and that. And, um, you know, I rode my bike to an appointment the other day and it felt great just doing that because I, not only did I make it on time and all of those things I was concerned about, I enjoyed the whole adventure, getting out the movement. It was good for me, you know, and, um, I used to do that when I was younger in Seattle. I I would bike, you know, 15 to 20 miles a day just to school or whatever. And I could have taken the bus, but, um, you know, it was, it was something that I had missed. And, you know, I, I just picture driving across the country and how, how wonderful that could be. And then oh man damn it you see some garbage and then how wonderful and oh man you know so um before we talked my mindset was like this is so exciting how cool um you know to go across the u.s so slowly on a bike and um and i start my day slow i don't go on the internet or use my phone for an hour or at the end of the day as well i try to do the same for an hour or two um, you know, and, and that calms me down and slows me down. Um, and that's sort of my slow start. And it sounds like you did that with your life. And I started out running away from home in the military, just hitting my head on everything. <laughs> and so all that to be said is that we're, you and I are in similar places, obviously diff totally different ideas and mindset but here we are in agreement that we want to make change and thank you michael making positive actions popular um i don't think that's a real challenge i just think it's a creative thing we haven't indulged in the only real challenge is there's a lot of corporations that don't want to participate in that but those are just the wrong corporations we're just looking in the wrong place you know there are a lot of up-and-comers I don't know if you're watching um, all the businesses that have come out of 2020 and it's from a lot of people like you and I that said, I will no longer do A, B or C. Some of those are environmental, personal. I would say 80% to me feels like, you know, um, majority of mental health issues. You know, um, this week uh, I, I commented on a post, seven teachers quitting their jobs um, and one principal in about 48 hours because, and they were all talking mental health. And, you know, to me, what that is showing is that the school system doesn't work. If our teachers that are teaching our kids are so struggling with mental health, um, 
I struggle with mental health and my way to it is to slow down and listen to myself and find out what really matters, you know. Um, what else we got? Michael proposes a reality show, get coupons, you know, a ton of money and groceries. That would be really cool. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the grocery stores are owned by, you know, you know, big corporations too. So maybe we need to develop a new grocery store that only runs on coupons, gets out of tax and cash. <laughs> and if you bring in 20 bags of garbage or something, you know, you, you get enough discount to feed your family. I don't know. We can think huge on this. You know who we have uh, in the green room here is uh, is Perry Nopper, uh, founder of the Octopus Movement. Um, let's bring him on. Hey, Perry. Good morning. Good afternoon. How are you today? Hello, hello. Can you hear me? <laughs> Loud and clear. How are We're you, just... Katie? I'm doing really well. Yeah. I, We're I, talking I, eco side. Yeah. Having a great conversation. Yeah, but I can. I, there's an echo in on on my headphones. Why is that? Do, do you know that, Darren? We don't have any echo. On echo, you. echo. Oh no. Okay. Doesn't matter. I'm just popping in quickly and and shortly. This is this is about Katie and Darren, and not about me. I'm just going to say hi. How are you all doing? And it was so much fun yesterday with the the think tank and brainstorming about eco side and what we should do and how we can do something together and, and just take some action and, and not waiting for legislation and, and politics and money to, to move forward. So, yeah. and I'm happy you're interviewing Darren, all the people in all the members of the think tank. Um, yeah, so it's exciting. Thank you for that. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely. You know, um, Dr. Octopus, uh, yeah, what do you think? <laughs> what you I, I want to know from, from Katie and, and from Darren, um, someone created the title for me, Dr. Octopus. I would have never done that myself, but that's, uh, that's Howard in South Africa, who is really a legend in, in creating stories and writing books and whatnot. And when he talks about me on LinkedIn, he always refers to me as Dr. Octopus. And I kind of like it. I think it's, it's funny. What do you think, Katie? Should I use Dr. Octopus all the time or is it a bit sketchy? <laughs> No, absolutely. I think Dr. Octopus could either be an evil genius or a superhero. So superhero yeah. it is. And <laughs> I think yeah. with the, you know, you're getting a PhD in nonlinear thinking. So free movement and everything else trying to collect all of us. So Dr. Octopus is quite fitting. I think you're creating a PhD in, in nonlinear thinking by not creating it just yourself, by inviting <laughs> the globe to help you create this, which is so cool, you know. Love that. Okay, and and I have to I have to share something new that I'm I'm working on a course in in the movement that is a that's going to be a training for a, a boost of neurons in your brain, and I'm calling it the the brain lunch, and mm. it's it's given by five amazing trainers, people that really really inspire. And it's, it's like an acupunctural session. So every day it's one hour for five days. And then lots of things will happen with your nonlinear thinking and who you are and how you see yourself and, and everything around it. And, and, I, and I don't only feel like Dr. Octopus, but also like Chef Octopus, because it's it's working with amazing creative beautiful people and then bringing that all together into one lunch where where our brain is going to be spoiled and and so cool so maybe it's going to be dr chef octopus something like that i feel like a chef <laughs> you are you, or a dj of life you know perry where you're taking bits and pieces and putting them together in a new song. You know, I love that. Um, you know, it's the same thing as a recipe. You're just making it your own and it's a wonderful creation. You know, I'm writing know that down, Darren. <laughs> DJ of life. How cool is that? <laughs> of all these titles. <laughs> I want to tell you that um, in the midst of this discussion, Katie came up with uh, a, a true viable solution, I think, to global waste management that isn't being done. 
And um, not only is it just at this point was a concept, but this could be something that we could take on uh, to a brainstorming session and and figure out how to materialize. And that's um, removing waste from the ocean by somehow making it cool and enticing our fishermen throughout the globe to do that while they're already sitting out there when they're coming back or, you know, there's a way. There's something happening out there. There's already vessels out there. There's a possibility we can do it. And it was Katie's idea. So in five years, when we see this materialize, we're going to come back to this discussion, you know, in a, in a, a show I wasn't even ready for. Katie wasn't even ready for. We did it out of inspiration. Um, and that's how this stuff changes. You know, we keep going, we keep going. We have these discussions. And what happens? Because because Katie and I are so different, she comes up with the idea. And, you know, I know a bunch of fishermen. And then we have Michael in the audience, you know, mentioning some stuff about New England. Like, yes, there are issues and we can sort them out. We created them. We can we can sort them out um, if we pay attention to each other and utilize community, you know, and make it a joyful experience. And that's the thing. If we create the mycelium network of brains, and we and we use our atypical thinking into innovative and creative ideas, and share that with each other, and help each other, and and don't wait until you know you have an investor or you have the government behind you just do it by working together then right. we will be able to do amazing amazing shit right yeah <laughs> amazing shit <laughs> you know what's what's really crazy um perry we didn't know this until we were getting ready to do the show but katie and i are not very far from each other maybe five six hour drive not only that but we're both indigenous you know, native, she's uh, Native American, I'm First Nations Canadian. Um, but we we are from the same Turtle Island here that people call America. And that's pretty cool. We the mycelium network that you're talking about where you have one organize or one organism supporting and discussing through, you know, microscopic movements and electrical impulses to each other and support. Yeah. Um, what if that happened today and, and this week? You know, we don't we don't know how our brains fully function, but I really think we're sort of mushrooms on the uh, in the dirt. And, and today our our brains connected on a level and I'm feeling inspired. I'm having fun and I'm enormously grateful to know Katie now. I, I, I feel like a new friend I've, I've earned, you know, um, because it's important to. To connect with other people like this and listen and understand, you know, where people That's are coming branch, from. Huh? The, the branch are, are like a mycelium. It's connecting and it's connecting every time by one human. So someone, so we're here with the three of us. Someone is listening and is thinking with us and is connecting in our thinking into that mycelium. And then there is another branch and there is another branch and there's another branch and someone is looking at this while it's recorded so not even live but then mm -hmm. even when it's recorded you're connecting to that same branch in thinking about this topic and i find that fascinating and i and i think yeah. we can establish amazing things and how can we partner with the ocean cleanup dude he's dutch katie he's dutch yeah i i, I know so i need to call him i need to say listen we we need to we need to work together we need to do something um, I've already reached out to him once to get him in the book of Project 398. I will, uh, I will do it again because, of course, it is interesting to, um, to be in the movement, in the Global Art Project, but also with your idea and brainstorm with the think tank. So I will reach out to him. So this is the oceancleanup.com and you're trying to connect with who there? Uh, what's his name? I don't remember. I'm okay. so bad with names. You're, you're both Katie but, and Darren, and then it stops with me. So know? we're looking, but we want to connect with the ocean cleanup. And if we're part of a mycelium network, it's cool to kind of put that out there. So 
Um, if you're in our network, which is huge between the three of us um, of, of human beings, and you know anyone at theoceancleanup.com, would you please reach out to any one of us through um, LinkedIn, Facebook, or by any means? Uh, we would love to know them. And um, what's the ask? What do we want? want so from his, the name ocean? Is, his name is Boyan Slut. And, wow. and, and the little fucker is only 18 years old. <laughs> oh, we can get a hold of him then. Have you heard of this? This, this is not new, but they're no. cleaning up the great ocean, like the Pacific great garbage patch. And so yeah. they're already out there cleaning up the garbage patch because they've developed, I think like they're on version two. They finally figured out a way to actually collect the garbage and pull it on the boat. That's pretty incredible. So. Wow. It's that amazing. And, 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 so and, how can you partner with them to incentivize commercial fishermen or other people, vessels that are already out there with the same gear or whatever? Like, I'm sure well, they if, it, this. if anything, Katie, that that's our that's our people, right? They're there. We want to know you if you work for them or if even if you're inspired by the ocean cleanup, you know, stop by the you know the um the octopus movement facebook group um you can learn more there um the uh the octopus movement.org um you can send perry a message that way or a direct message we we want to know the ocean cleanup crew this isn't how we started today's show but this is how inspiration happens and um i'm i'm of the idea that if you need something you should ask because i didn't for a long time and there's a lot of people in this world that do want to support and help people like us because, um, you know, Perry, you and I, we kick doors down and make shit happen. That's who we are in totally different ways, totally different ways. And Katie, I, I'm sure you're of that same mindset if you're, um, you know, maybe hopefully a little more subtle than I am, the two of you. But, uh, you know, w there's... I don't think so. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. Oh, my God. <laughs> so there's doors that need to open, and we're, we're asking. So um, maybe later today, if anyone is out there, send us uh, anybody from the Ocean Cleanup. We just want to talk to them. Maybe we get them on, on a discussion like this and ask them how they had this first discussion and how long it took before they built their first vessel and got out there and what in that journey is applicable to us today. How can yeah, we how learn we from can that? Help, and how can we help with our mycelium network of amazing brains to connect to all these ships there? And how can we connect things together? That's what we're good at, the octopus movement, is connecting things together, solve issues, and, and, and look you know, in, in a broader perspective and, and find solutions for whatever problem there is. That's what we're good at, at the octopus movement. Absolutely. Okay, guys, I'm going to leave you. I need to go into uh, another interview. Have fun. Thank Behave. you, Perry. Uh, I will see you next time. I will disappear. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Octopus. Bye, Perry. <laughs> Bye Katie. Bye, Darren. Bye. See ya. Well, Katie, we, we've got a long, long show today, hour 20. Yeah. Um, you know, but the great thing is we've had wonderful discussion. And so... Um, it'll be saved and, and we can go back and, and find bite-sized pieces of this stuff and, and share it with friends or go back and challenge our own thinking, you know, again, which is also fun. Um, so ju just to be perfectly clear, I did not know about that ocean cleanup until today and how amazing it is to just show up and learn from another human. Um, and now I'm inspired and now I want to do something about it. How many other people are going to do something about compost today? Maybe they pick up their bike instead. Maybe they decide to start growing something or cut back on something. You know, um, maybe they they are fishermen and you made them think today, Katie. So, um, you know, I'm really, really grateful, not only for your shampoo recipe, and I'm not even kidding about that. That's a real thing well, <laughs> because... I because uh you know it's a bite-sized piece that i'm willing to give a give a try to so um thank you so much for coming today 
uh, don't go away. I'm going to send you to the green room and uh, announce, you know, what's coming up this next week. And uh, and then we will uh, wrap the show. So thank you again, Katie. You've been a wonderful guest. Do you have any final uh, conclusion or um, anything else you'd like to share with anyone? Yeah. Who knew that this conversation started with a hot air balloon and ended with, you know, call out for ocean cleanup to come out and help us with some ideas. So I love it. I love yeah. we're just having a conversation. If anyone wants to continue a conversation, please find me on Pick My Brain as well. I would love to talk to you. Awesome. And I will drop that in the LinkedIn and Facebook comments. Uh, Katie's Pick My Brain link. Uh, Katie, thank you again for joining us today. You've been a wonderful and insightful guest. Um, love your mindset. I love the fact that you're out of the box and that you do a lot of different things. So a big uh, Gayla Kessler, thank you. And uh, we'll talk to you real soon. Thank you. Cheers. Everyone, thank you for joining us. This has been um, a follow-up to the Octopus Movement uh, think tank discussion from yesterday on uh, Facebook group, theoctopusmovement.org. Uh, Katie joined us to uh, really just discuss uh, what small things we could do, small changes. And tomorrow we'll have someone else and ongoing through next week. Uh, looks like a lot of the Octopus group members that joined the Think Tank are gonna join us, which is always inspiring. And if we thought of one great idea today on accident, what could come tomorrow so i hope you join thank you if you're in the audience and appreciate it if you are following us on replay have a wonderful day everyone and gala kasla hey lakasla <laughs>